unanswered questions. We are to accept the reality that there are some questions that will never be answered until we are in God's presence in eternity. Here now is Dr. Gene Getz. When we look at this prophet, Habakkuk, and when, when we look at what he wrote, we see that he had a lot of unanswered questions. In fact, he died having unanswered questions. And it's really fascinating to see the struggle that he had at this particular moment in biblical history. Now, we believe that he probably prophesied during the time of Jehoiakim, who became the king of Judah. And when we understand Jehoiakim and his evil nature, then we understand Habakkuk's disillusionment and his concerns. Uh, you see, he, uh, this particular king, Jehoiakim, came in after his father, King Josiah. And King Josiah, uh, he was a king that, uh, that discovered the book of the law and it's instituted reforms in Judah. In fact, here's a summary of Josiah's reforms. Now keep in mind, he's the king before Jehoiakim. Josiah allowed the Word of God to penetrate his own heart and soul. You see that when he discovered the law. He just repented in sackcloth and ashes. He read the Word of God to all of his leaders. He got them all together and he said, we're sinning against God. Number three, he made a public covenant to obey the Word of God. He said this before all the people of Judah. Number four, he eliminated all idolatrous activities in Israel. I mean, he destroyed the Baals, the Asherah poles, the, uh, the idols. That must have been an incredible thing to see that happening as people went out and destroyed all of these idols. And finally, he reinstated the Passover feast to remember God's deliverance of Israel. Josiah did all of these things. And then, here comes King Jehoiakim. And what do we read in 2 Kings? Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. Everything that Josiah had done, he undid. Brought back the idols brought back the evil, the, the idolatry, the, uh, the sexual immorality. And what happened is that Habakkuk is called to prophesy at this time, and he is really, really disillusioned about what has happened. In fact, just for your memory, King Jehoiakim was the one where Jeremiah was called to write the prophecy and take that prophecy and have it read before the king, Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim sat in his palace and listened and then had him bring the scroll that Isaiah wrote and with his knife cut it, the Word of God, cut it in pieces and threw it in the fire. That's how evil this man was. And that helps us to understand um, the judgment that's going to come and why Habakkuk was, was so concerned about it. He saw all of this evil, but he was also praying that his people would turn about. And so we have his, what I call, desperate prayer. He prayed this prayer, How long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence, and you do not save. Lord, where are you? And he asked a series of why questions. By the way, it's okay to ask why. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God understands why questions. Why do you force me to look at injustice? God had called him to look at all this and to prophesy against it. Why do you tolerate wrongdoing, Lord? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. Well, finally God responded to his plea. And we read about this in, in verse 6. Look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians. And by the way, the response did not comfort Habakkuk. It increased his disillusionment. 
But God was speaking the truth. He said, look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories, not its own. I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to bring judgment. And that happened. We know that happened because in uh, 605, remember, Daniel was taken along with his three friends. And then later, 597, 10,000 Jews were taken. And then in 586, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. In other words, what God said here is going to happen. But that was so difficult for Habakkuk. And in his continual disillusionment, listen to his words in verses 12 and 13. His theology is correct. Listen, are you not from eternity, Yahweh, my God? That's good theology. My Holy One, you will not die. He's got his theology straight. But the fact is that his theology about God and who he is did not bring comfort in the midst of what was happening to his life. And as I was just reflecting on that, I remember a conversation I had with the late Dr. John Walvert. And he shared this one-on-one -on -one with me with tears in his eyes because he had a series of very difficult times in his family life with two sons who were born with mental problems and challenges in their life and had to be hospitalized for life. Then he had a son, his last son, that was just a star, a rising star, got his medical degree and was on his way with his wife to set up a practice in another part of the country and hit road equipment and was killed. And here were this, this final son that he just, that gave him hope and encouragement. And with tears in his eyes, he said, you know, I've got all the answers. I've got the theological answers. And I talked to my wife and yet, Jean, all the theological answers in the world about God just don't comfort her because of the tragedy that's happened in our life. Habakkuk was having the same problem. That shouldn't surprise us. Now, we need to have correct theology, but the fact is we can have correct theology and still be disillusioned in terms of what's happening in life and the evil that exists in this world. And so, uh, he goes on here. He says, Lord... You appointed them to execute judgment, referring to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. My rock, you destined them to punish us. I don't understand that. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I know that about you, God. So why? Why do you tolerate those who are treacherous, those evil Babylonians? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? In other words, I know that we are evil. I know that the king is evil, but he's more righteous than Nebuchadnezzar. Why are you letting this happen to us? So he just lays out his heart and his disillusionment in this particular situation. But you see, God wants to teach him a powerful lesson. And it's this, God is a sovereign God, and He can use anyone or anything to accomplish His goals. That's true. And as I reflected on that lesson that Habakkuk was learning, I couldn't help but think of Joseph, who centuries before was sold into Egypt just as a young man of 17, 18, how he was falsely accused of immorality, how he was thrown into prison, how he was forgotten. And eventually, of course, he became the prime minister of Egypt, which was an amazing thing. But after his father and the whole family were brought down to Egypt after having saved all these people, uh, his brothers were so covered over with guilt, they thought he was going to get even. And now that their father Jacob had died, he was going to take their lives for what they had done to him and selling him into Egypt. And Joseph heard about it. And he called them in. And this is what he said. But Joseph said to them, that is to his brothers, don't 
be afraid. They were really scared to death that they were going to lose their lives. I mean, he was the prime minister of Egypt. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present results, the survival of many people. Now, how do you answer that? How do you explain that? Now, God can take evil and make it work together for good. Not that God causes evil, but He can use the evil to carry out His purposes. That's exactly what He did in Habakkuk's day. And God is trying to explain that to him so that he might really get that, that message. So, really, what we have here in Habakkuk is still unanswered questions. That didn't answer all the questions. And here's the unanswered questions. We are to accept the reality that there are some questions that will never be answered until we are in God's presence in eternity. That's a reality. You know, Job went through this. At the end of his life, God restored, but it never says he explained to him what happened and why he went through all of that suffering. Now, he knows, obviously, that he's in eternity. But that's a great lesson. And as I thought about that, I thought again about the book of Romans that I've shared on other occasions when we've looked at principles from the prophets. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments, untraceable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? We know something about Him, but we certainly don't know all there is to know about Him. Or who has been His counselor? The answer is nobody. Or who has ever first given to Him and has to be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things to Him. Be the glory forever. Amen. And so here's the principle that comes from Habakkuk and also from the book of Romans. We're to accept the reality that there are some questions that will never be answered until we are in God's presence in eternity. And I can cite many, many illustrations. For example, who can answer the question, why do the righteous suffer? But here's a more difficult one. Why do the unrighteous prosper when the righteous suffer? We can only rely on God who knows the answer to those questions. There are no simple answers except that we have to trust Him. Like Job said, though He slay me, yet I'll trust Him. And this is a message that's coming to us. I can share with you story after story of, of situations where I can't explain it. For example, a good friend of mine, Bruce Long, his wife died of cancer. She faced that. Phyllis faced that with incredible grace. But then they had a funeral. And the daughter invited another friend to come from another city to come to Dallas to be a part of the funeral for her mother. And while this friend is on the way, she's in one car with her children, two children. The husband is in another car in front. He looks in the rearview mirror and saw a car cross the median and hit his wife and kill her and the two children while they're on the way to the funeral of her friend. Now explain that. I can't. I have to say, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. We can only, in situations like this, claim Romans 8.28. And we have to do that by faith. Simply that all things work together for good to those who love God.